this is going to be a review of what we have done. Our first section, introduction, tells us about this sutta called Volitional, Patama Sanjaitanika Sutta in Anguttara 10.217, which says that one cannot run away from the results of karma. We must experience this result sooner or later. And one cannot be liberated without having done so. Being liberated means making an end of suffering in samsara. It means the physical death of an arahant, not the moment of enlightenment of an arahant. Do you all find this reasonable and logical? Do you agree? Do you think it's really possible for a person to pay back all his coming debts, to experience all the good and bad karma from the inconceivable beginning of samsara until the moment he attains Khandaparinibbana? You think it's possible? If you're an accountant, you will say it's not possible. <laughs> Let me give you a very good example. You all have heard of Bahia. It's found in the Udana. Bahia was an external ascetic. He was wearing tree bark as his robes and he lived at the seaside in India during the Buddha's time. He was very well respected by the people around there. They regarded him as an arahant, so they supported him with abundant requisites, with great respect and veneration. So with all this, he himself thought that he was an arahant. But one day, out of compassion for him, a deva who was related to him in a past life, appeared to him and told him point blank, you are not an arahant. You have not attained the, the path to arahantship and you don't know how to get there. So he was stunned. You know, all the while, everybody regarded him as an arahant and he thought he was one and this deva says he's not. So then he asked, if I'm not an arahant, who is? Who is an arahant in this world with his devas and his brahmas? This deva says, the Samasambuddha. He's a real arahant. He's got the path to arahantship. And if you really want to be an arahant, go and see him. He's in Sawati now. So Bahia was in a hurry. He was seized by a sense of urgency. And he left his seaside hermitage and walked all the way to Sawati. You know how far Sawati is from the seaside? <laughs> and he walked so fast that he stopped only one night in one village in order to get to Sawati as fast as he could. And when he reached Jetavana, he asked the monks where the Buddha was. And the monks said the Buddha went out to Sawati for arms round. So quickly, he went to Sawati to search for the Buddha. And he found the Buddha on arms round. He bowed to him, paid respect, and begged the Buddha to teach him the Dhamma in brief. The Buddha said, wait, Bahia, wait, this is not the right time. I'm on arms round. Wait until I finish. But Bahia could not wait. He implored the Buddha, says, Bhante, please teach me the Dhamma in brief right now because we don't know if there's any danger to my life or to your life. The Buddha refused. Again, the Buddha said, wait, Bahiya, wait, be patient. Wait until I finish my arms round. This is not suitable time. Then the third time, Bahiya begged the Buddha to teach him, saying again that we do not know if there's any danger to my life or to your life. So please teach me the Dhamma in brief right now. And the Buddha relented. And the Buddha said, in that case, listen. In the scene, there shall only be the seen. In the heard, there shall only be the heard. In the sensed, there shall only be the sensed. In the cognized, there shall only be the cognized. Thus shall you train yourself. When, Bahia, you can train yourself like that, in, that, in the scene, there's only the scene. In the heard, there's only the heard. In the sense, there's only the sense. In the cognized, there's only the cognized then you will not be with that. 
when you're not with that, then you will not be in that. And when you're not in that, you will neither be here, nor hereafter, nor in between both. And that is the very end of suffering. That's all the Buddha said. Then when Bahiya heard that, he attained Arahanship. So fast. No retreat. Just this few words, and he already attained Arahanship. Then soon after that, he left the Buddha. And according to the commentary, not in the suttas, the commentary says, after he became an Arahant, he had asked the Buddha for ordination to become a bhikkhu. And the Buddha said, I can't ordain you because you don't have a bowl, you don't have ropes, so go look for a bowl and ropes. So he left the Buddha in search of a bowl and ropes. And soon afterwards, he was caught to death by a cow. Later, some of the monks saw his body by the roadside and came to report to the Buddha and asked the Buddha, Bhante, what happened to this Bahiya? He asked you to teach him the Dhamma in brief, and now he's dead. So what happened to him? Where is he now? And the Buddha said, Oh, monks, Bahiya is a man of swift wisdom. He did not vex me with many Dhamma questions. He has become an Arahant. He is one of your holy Dhamma fairers. Go cremate his body and do the stupa for him. So in this story, Bahiya became an Arahant and within an hour or so, he was gone to death. So do you think within that time, he can pay back all his coming deaths? Can or not? It sounds impossible, isn't it? Maybe you could say that before he came to Sawati, when he was staying at the seaside, and people thought he was an Arahant, and they supported him with abundant requisites. Maybe he was at that time enjoying the benefits of his past good karma. Right? And because he was practicing the austerities, maybe that was experiencing the effects of his bad past karma. But still, Soon after he became an Arahant, within that short period of time, it seems impossible for him to be able to experience the results of all his good and bad karma from the inconceivable beginning of samsara until then. Right? That's why the Buddha said in Anguttara Nikaya, Kamma vipako achinteyo. (laughs) The result of karma is unthinkable. One who attempts to think of the result of karma can become partially deranged or distressed. All right? So that's why the third simile is very important. The third simile talks about the power. You know, the power of attainment. The power of attainment has this ability to make this happen, although it may seem unreasonable and illogical. But don't talk about Narahant. Even for a Sotapanna, this is also remarkable. Because a Sotapanna has only got seven more lifetimes to live, maximum. Correct? And whatever mad karma that he had done in the past, from the inconceivable beginning of Tansara until the moment of attainment, all those karma, all those bad karma, that can generate rebirth in the lower realms, become null and void. They don't have the power to generate rebirth in the lower realms anymore. Although they can still generate unpleasant, painful results in in the course of his existence before he becomes an Arahant or before he attains Kandaparinibbana. But it will not cause rebirth in the lower realms. Okay, So this again is the power of attainment. Right? So the third simile is very significant. The third simile is showing that with power, you can do anything and get away with it. Then in the Root Sutta, the Lamb of Salts, the Buddha said that one doesn't experience karma in precisely the same way that one created it. For example, killing a chicken by slashing his throat doesn't mean one will be killed in that same way. But when one creates karma that is to be experienced in a particular way, one experiences its result 
in that way. In the above example, one could be killed, grievously hurt, or slightly injured. Whatever it is, whatever unwholesome karma that is created will give painful results. But the degree of pain and duration of pain varies with the individual. And here it says, a similar bad past karma can give different results to different people. It can lead one to hell, but it makes another suffer only in this very life, not in the next. So who can go to hell? Someone who is undeveloped in body, morality, mind and wisdom. And is therefore limited by his virtues, has a mean character and dwells in suffering. And who can suffer only in this life? One who is developed in body, morality, mind and wisdom, is unlimited by his virtues, has a lofty character and dwells without measure. As a lofty character here is a translation of the Pali word Mahatta, which means great self. And dwells without measure could mean dwelling in the divine abidings. And dwells without measure seems to imply that this person could live in any of the four Brahmaviharas, Metta, Karuna, Mudita and Upeka. Why? Because this is supposed to be an Arahant. And Arahant has fully understood not-self. He has understood that everything, all Sankaras arise due to causes and conditions. So even if he encounters nasty people, very vicious people, very unscrupulous world leaders, he can understand and forgive them and even can have compassion for them because he knows that they are all victims of the defilements. Even though people may not become arahants, but if you constantly watch your mind, right? look back at your mind, watch the subjective experiencer, then you can understand how the mind works, your mind and other people's minds. For example, you walk along the street, you go to the supermarket, to the mall, and then you see some interesting items, and greed arises in you, you know it's not going to be useful, but you still want to buy. Correct? You can't resist the temptation of buying. And you know it. You got, you're mindful. You know there's greed there and you shouldn't buy. Yet you buy. <laughs> and times when you know anger has arisen, and you know anger has arisen, and you better keep your mouth shut. Don't open your mouth. Don't say this because you're going to get into trouble. But yet, you say it and you get into trouble. <laughs> Doesn't this happen? Yeah? So often. So when you see your own mind, you understand that even you, supposed to be a meditator, cannot even control your own mind. How about other people who are not meditators? Right? Instead of condemning them, instead of being antagonistic towards them, being indignant, you need to understand and forgive them. Have compassion for them. It doesn't mean that you just become indifferent. You can try to the best of your abilities to change things according to your means and your interests because that is also a cause and condition that could bring about a positive change. However, there are also other causes and conditions that might override your effort and things might turn out otherwise. Right? So it's a very complicated web of causes and conditions. Now you can try according to your means and interest. Yeah. Otherwise, in the end, you just go back to equanimity and accept that it's all due to causes and conditions beyond your control. So that's how these arahants can live in the world and yet not off the world. We went to a tabulation of our cross-references and... After going through that, I made some comments. We have to be careful with the usage of terms. Sometimes the same terms are used with different meanings depending on context. And we must be careful not to simply copy and paste out of context. And it's for this reason that I did not include the Buddha's explicit 
explanation of develop in body and develop in mind. Although it is the Buddha's words, or rather the Buddha himself gave a very explicit definition of develop in body and develop in mind, I did not use it in my interpretation. Why? Because the context is different. Our context makes use of a composite of the four terms. Develop in body, in moral behavior, in mind, and in wisdom. In the context of MN36, only two are referred to, which are undeveloped or developed in body and mind. Why? Because Sajaka came to the Buddha and asked him these two questions about development of body and development of mind. And his idea of development of body is the austerities, self-modification. And he was praising the self-modification of the other teachers during the Buddha's time. Then, when he came to development of mind, the Buddha asked him, then, how do you understand development of mind? And he could not give an answer. So the Buddha gave him his answer. The Buddha's version of what he understood by development of body and development of mind. The answer given by the Buddha was a specific response to the questions asked by Sachaka. So, I don't think that can be applied in our case, because in our case, it is not about what Sachaka was asking, but it is about the composite usage of these four terms, as we saw in the other contexts. Now, the word kaya, as I said, in most cases, it means the physical body. But in some cases, like this one, about being developed in body, it does not mean body in the conventional sense, but it means the subjective experiencer. The mind that is reacting to what is perceived through the six senses. So I gave my interpretation of what is meant by developed in body, in virtue, in mind, in wisdom, in the context of our root sutta, based on what we have here, what I've given you. Developed in body means restraint of the six senses, overlapping with right thought and right effort. Developed in virtue means having right action, right speech, right livelihood. Developed in mind means having right thought, right effort, right mindfulness, right samadhi. And developed in wisdom means having right view and right knowledge. With regard to MN36, where the commentary explained developed in body as vipassana, also, it doesn't fit in this context because in this context, the personal will come under wisdom. All right. Now I have some comments that I made just now, just to repeat. The significance of the similes, the similes are not about the quantity of good karma or meritorious deeds, not just any good karma, any good meritorious deeds, but about the quality and power of certain things to be developed. In particular, those things that are connected with the noble for path that can lead you out of samsara. Not those good deeds that will keep you in samsara, but in a good way, in a pleasant and enjoyable way. Although the Sutta talks about development of body, moral virtue, mind and wisdom in terms of the qualities of an Arahant as the basic principle behind being able to diminish the effects of bad past karma, we can draw an implication that it may also be possible for people who are not yet fully developed, but who are walking the noble full path. Right, so if you are a practitioner walking the noble full path, at least you stand more chances of being able to diminish the effects of a bad karma compared to Buddhists who do not practice the noble full path. Okay, before I end, a couple of things yet to be answered. In the beginning, I showed you this presentation on Hado, how vibrations can affect the quality of water, correct? And also, you must have heard of people who are suffering in various ways, and then they go for repentance ceremony, or they invite monks and uh, very powerful lamas to chant for them, and then they recover, correct? 
So some people ask me, isn't that diminishing the effects of bad past karma? How do you think? If it's so simple, then anyone who is sick and he goes to see a doctor and gets cured will be diminishing the effects of a bad past karma. <laughs> Correct. Although these work in the sense that they help to relieve you of suffering, it does not mean that you are actually diminishing the effects of your bad past karma. Probably you are postponing them, sweeping them under the carpet for future ripening. Now, in one workshop, somebody also asked, how do we as lay people practice restraint of the six senses? Because if you really practice restraint of the six senses, all of you would have to become monks and nuns. <laughs> Correct. So, you have to apply different standards. When you are on an intensive meditation retreat, you practice like a monk or a nun. Right? When you go back home, you practice like a layman. You restrain the six senses according to the five precepts. As long as you don't break the five precepts and you don't upset your partner by spending too much <laughs> going window shopping, <laughs> then that should be okay. Okay?